We'll have more worship a bit later. But basically, worship is much more than singing, right? Worship is an, an attitude, a connection with, with heaven, a determined connection, intentional connection with heaven. So stay in that worshiping attitude because God is here. God is going to instruct us and speak to us about how to pull down the walls. Now you're awake, okay? Me too. This Bulgarian weather is really getting me. But we survive as we did previously. John 14, 23. We'll speak a little bit. And then we will work a little bit. You will work a little bit. I will not work all night. You will have to work a little bit. Because we are serious about pulling down walls. That's why it's called Beyond Walls. I'm not sure there will be Beyond Walls number three. But now it's number two. And it suits what I've seen in the book of Joshua. That there are two types of walls. There are external walls. And there are internal walls. And the external walls are the visible ones. They are the ones we, in the most easy way, can register, identify. But sometimes the internal walls are quite difficult. They are more sophisticated because they are internal. All right? So John 14, what did I say? 23. Jesus answered him. You, didn't, you don't need to know the question. It was not a very good question. But the answer is very good. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. Okay, did you get it? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. So we keep his word because we love the one who said it. That's why. So we're not in a... We are not into the obedience issue, you know. We are in the love obedience issue. Because we love him, we keep his word. You know? I listen to my wife because I love her. I don't listen to everybody in the streets I meet, in the supermarket or somewhere else. Because I don't know them. I can listen to them, but I uh, goes in, goes out. When my wife speaks, goes in. And she watches if it goes out again. <laughs> Even when my children, because I have adult children, the youngest is, let me think, changes every, way, every year. So 82, she is 37, I think. 37, so between 37 and 45, some. Yes, 40 some. And they are adults, they are smart they are born again so when they speak i listen to them because i love them i raise them we invested in them they have developed their own wisdom their own intelligence their own experiences so i'm listening to them as well so jesus said here if anyone loves me he will keep my word then he said and my father will love him which means, I'm not sure you will agree with me in that, but it's okay. I can live with that. But I believe that the Father can love us on different levels. I think so. It's up to you, but I think so, actually. Because, I mean, Jesus said it. If the Father sees that we love his Son and keep his word, he will pay attention to our lives because he loves his son and he honors his son and he is pleased with him that's why he said I'm well pleased with him so Jesus said if you keep my word which is a continuous thing maybe that's why there are two E's in keep is keep my word <laughs> I'm not sure about that but there is there is a continuous walk with him when the father sees that determination that i am i love his son and i love him so much that i trust him 
I walk with him, I believe in him, and I walk with him also in the course of time. My love does not decreases, my love increases. I love him more and more. I honor him more and more. I respect him more and more. I pay more and more attention to what he says because I love the speaker. That's why I love, I obey what he's saying. So the father sees our determination to listen to his son, to love him, and to keep the word of the son. And then Jesus said, my father will love you. His eyes will be on you. He will look after you on another level. Then the last statement goes like this. And we will come to him and make our home with him. That's an amazing statement. And for years, I mean, I'm raised a Christian. My first pastor was my father, biological father. So I'm almost born in church. I'm born in Africa, by the way. So, I mean, I should be able to take the Bulgarian heat when I'm born in Africa. <laughs> but as I told Pastor Kwame, I left when I was four years old. So maybe I got enough of it. I mean, my parents left, so I had to leave. Then I lived in England, and I lived in Switzerland, and whatever. So for many years, I thought, wow, Jesus, will, the Son will come, and the Father will come, and they will move into my home. What a tremendous thought. How nice. How sweet. How amazing. But then I realized, after I began to learn to know the Son better, when I began to learn the Father better, I understood that they don't just come to have a sweet time with me. When they come to us, to me, and move into my home, into my life, it's because they have certain things on their heart. They want to talk business. They want to talk about the kingdom. They want to talk about the progression, the advancement of the kingdom in Denmark, Romania, in Mongolia, which are the territories where God has placed me. So tonight, he wants to talk with us. He wants to talk with me. And he wants to give more instructions how to pull down the walls. Are you ready for that? Yes. Now, I said to you this morning, I will continue to catch up from this morning. And I will give you a small assignment we have to handle right here in the meeting. Yeah, but Philip, this is a breakthrough evening. What is breakthrough evening? God speaks all day long. We just have to follow him. Whatever he's in his heart, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the workshop, or at night, we just have to align with that and do it. Okay. So I said to you this morning, just to catch up with that and for the guests here tonight, that there are two types of walls. There are the external walls, and Joshua saw them, from Joshua chapter 6 until Joshua chapter 12. A lot of wars, a lot of kings, hostile kings, a lot of military situations. And he overcame because of God. God was there. And what I saw in the book of Joshua is Pharaoh could not stop them. All right? When they left, they left. Goodbye, Pharaoh. He could not stop them. I read, I read from my nose. The wilderness could not stop at least two of them. The rest died in the wilderness. My question is, what stopped them? Because in the wilderness, there was no hostile kings. There were no armies. There were no enemies. There were no external wars. They stopped because they could not handle the internal wars. That's why God said, I cannot. They don't qualify for the next decade, for the next generation, for the next assignment. The Jordan could not stop them because God fixed the problem. He made a way through the Jordan. Am I right? I said, am I right? That was the question. Okay. The walls of Jericho... And the next city, I could not stop them. 
The strong kings and the strong nations, Canaanites, Bible says they were strong people. Could not stop them. The Bible says the chariots of iron could not stop them. So in a way they were an unstoppable company of people. Because of God's presence among them. Are we, can we see that? All right. But that's the external wars. And they did extremely well. And most of us have done extremely well when it comes to external wars. That's why we're here today. We survived by the grace of God. We killed some kings here and there. We pulled down certain things here and there. And we survived the wilderness. We survived this and that. But then, from Josh, Joshua chapter 13, as I was into that this morning, then something different happened. Somebody said, if you only have a hammer, you treat every problem as a nail. You heard that before? You heard that before. Okay. I have a hammer. I'm not very good at that, but I have some tools in the cellar. And I use them from time to time without hurting myself or destroying anything in the house. So sometimes we have just one solution for every problem. That's not good enough. Amen? I remember the days years ago, you, don't, you were not even born in those days, where we said, worship, how was that? Worship breaks all chains. It's not the case. God breaks all chains. Sometimes he uses worship, sometimes he uses prayer, sometimes he uses uh, the words from the confession from our mouth, sometimes he uses just our standing firm and keeping the territory and not resigning, not giving up. That's strong enough. God can use that to break chains and overcome the enemies. So don't think because you have learned one thing that you will win all the wars. You will not. You need more tools in your toolbox. But God has all the tools. He has all the weaponry which is necessary for us. So something very different happened. Not suddenly, but progressively, something rose from the inside. It sneaked on them. They realized that Jericho, the kings, the strong nations they were facing, the chariots of iron, were quite easy to handle compared to the walls inside of them. Have you made that discovery? You can stand against the devil, and if we stand firm, he will flee from us. But what if there is something inside of us? We cannot flee from it because it is, it is inside of us. Are you with me? So the purpose of the external wars was to keep them out of the promised land. The purpose of the internal war is to hinder you, hinder me, in standing and building and influencing the nation. And this morning, you have already responded to the word of God. You have listened to my word, and I'm sure you heard something. Did you hear something this morning? Yes. I hope you heard something. I mean, I heard something. And your faces told me, yes, you are right. That's the way it is. Because you know your external enemies, but you also you have faced and you have seen the faces of some internal issues. Am I right in that? This morning, I mentioned for you four walls. Okay? Let me mention that from the, for you. The wall of indifference. You said that? Indifference? Yeah. What is indifference? Somehow, we give up and we are just, we keep a distance to things. We are indifferent. We see things, we observe things, but it does not appeal to us. God had to shake Joshua and wake him up. The second wall I mentioned for you this morning is the wall of a sorrowful soul. You carry grief 
you carry pain, you carry sorrow inside of you. You have to pull down that wall. Number three, the wall of legitimate excuses. You remember that one? I think I hit home with that one for some of you. I mean, for me. And then the fourth wall was the wall of the others. What others think about you, mean about your work, your relationship, relationship with God, your connection with your spiritual fathers, your membership of your local church. Now this is extremely important because when you get home, they are waiting for you. And there is no Paul to lead you in worship. There is no Emmanuel. There is no Pastor Heiner. There are no... You are on your own. And maybe they don't show up here, but they're waiting for you at home. They're waiting for me at home. Are you catching this? And we have to pull these walls down. I have to pull these walls down. I did that. We have done that through the years. And I'm sure there will be more wars in the future. So tonight I have a small job for you. Are you ready for that? Yes. yes. It's not a workshop. I don't care what is what. But we have to work because these are very important issues. And with our experience of church life, both Pastor Kwan, Pastor Han, and myself, and Pastor Tony, who is not here, we know that we can win external wars. But then the internal wars can just get us. That's why we had to realize, my wife and I, we had to realize, you know, sometimes we live in a, in a dream world, in a world of, you know, faith and expectations and visions and so on. But we had to realize that potential is just not enough. We've seen people with great potential, but nothing happened at all. They won some big wars, they did well, but in the course of time, something got them. We don't want you to become a casualty in the future. This is our heart. That's why we speak to you. We are not here to impress you. We have, I have meetings enough, I can tell you. I don't, I don't need this. I have meetings, a lot of meetings and, and, and um, assignments I have to handle. So we don't need more job and more work, but we really, our heart is for you. That's why I feel privileged to be here with you this week. And I thank you for listening carefully because our heart is to avoid unnecessary casualties because we've seen that. We've seen good people. We've seen good couples. We've seen good young people. We have seen good families with such a potential but the internal wars took them. I'm not saying they lost salvation and they lost heaven. and Maybe we'll meet them there. But until then, their, life, their lives are purposeless. We don't want that to happen to you. Are you listening to me? And I believe I have the support in that from the other pastors. So, in the next 10, 15 minutes, I want you to put down on a, piece of, on a piece of paper. If you have paper, do that. iPad, tablets, whatever. If you don't have paper, steal it from somebody. You are forgiven beforehand. <laughs> and I want you to just use five, six, seven, eight minutes to identify your internal wars okay let me repeat to you the four wars I mentioned this morning the wall of indifference oh how was EYC great meetings took any decision mm, not really I hope there will be EYC 2019 maybe I will there you know indifference does not draw you anywhere the wall of a sorrowful soul maybe you carry pain you carry grief, you carry disappointments. Uh, 
Yeah, but you know, everybody can be disappointed. Disappointment is a very serious issue. If you carry it, it can be like a tumor inside your soul, eating up your energy, your trust in people. So we have to watch disappointment. The third wall was the wall of legitimate excuses. If you identify this is my next wall, I have to cope with that. Then put it on a piece of paper. The fourth one is the wall of the opinion of others. Did you get it? Four walls, the wall of inference, the wall of a sorrowful soul, the wall of legitimate excuses, the wall of the others. I'll give you five minutes now to put down maybe one of them. Don't put all four. Oh, Philip, we, will, uh, we really, we love you and we follow you and we will make you happy. Don't make me happy. Because I'm leaving tomorrow morning and on Monday, you are on your own and I am on my own. Okay? So put on paper, whatever it is. It can be one. Could be two. Maybe all four, but maybe some of them are more relevant than others at the present time, in your present life situation. Okay? The wall of indifference, the wall of a sorrowful soul, the wall of legitimate excuses, the wall of the, the opinion of others. Okay? Put that down on a piece of paper. All right, are you doing that? Don't feel ashamed. Don't feel like, oh... OMG, oh my God, this is really serious. <laughs> I mean, I told you this morning that the people who struggle with that, can I tell you the names? Is Joshua, is Caleb, is the son of Joseph. They were very good people. They were powerful people. So we can fight with that. We can struggle with that. And it's okay. But God wants to give you the victory and help you to pull down the walls. Maybe when you get home, you should talk with your youth leader, cell group leader, or your pastor, and tell them, you know, when Pastor Philip spoke Friday night, I decided I will pull down this wall. Please, support me. Inspire me. Pray for me. You still have to win the victory. They will not do that for you, but they can support you and maybe give you advices and facilitate what God wants to do in your life. All right. Did you do that? Yes or no? You finished? I mean, you, do you have 100 walls or what? <laughs> Just the four of them. There might be others, but these four are important because they are there in the book of Joshua. What I want you to do now is to stand up. I mean, fold your paper so nobody is private, okay? Don't let anybody... Have a look into your walls. Keep that for yourself. It's a private thing. It's your walk with God. God will give you a personal victory. Joshua had to win the victory for himself. Caleb had to win that victory. These five ladies, the Z sisters, I call them the Z sisters, they had to win that victory for themselves. The sons of Joseph had to do as well. So you can fold your paper or close your iPad or whatever. And I want you to meet, to stand up and be in groups. And I will give you eight, ten minutes to speak words of victory over these walls. Are you with me? Are you listening to me? Let me give you examples where you can say, you will not stand in my way anymore. Speak to the walls. You will not stop my progress and my walk with God. You will not abort my pursuits of the things of the kingdom. 
You will not paralyze me any longer. You will not take away my rightful legacy. This is the type of words you have to speak to the mountains, to the walls in your life. Tell them where you stand. And they will have to come down. Can we say amen to that? So please stand up. Form some groups here and there. And for the next five minutes, take your piece of paper in your hand or your closed tablet in your hand. And all together, you don't have to listen to one another. All together, raise your voice and speak to these walls. And tell them, you have to come down. Amen? So your walk with God can continue. Your walk with your house can continue. The walk with your spiritual fathers can continue. And you will win these internal wars. So the work of God can continue in your nation. We must become continuers. Can you say amen to that? Amen. All right. So can you form group very quickly? I said very quickly. Okay. Don't be a, don't be a shame and... Yeah, smile to one another and say, ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you have walls too. Okay, I have walls too. We all have some walls around. Okay. So, all right. Now, all of you, raise your voice at the same time and speak to your walls. Three, two, one, zero. Go for it. Yes, go for it. I heard your voices in the worship. Use the same voice. Speak to your walls. Say, you will not stand against me anymore. You will not stop my walk with God. You will not paralyze me anymore. You will not intimidate me anymore. I will win the battle. I will pull you down. I will speak to the mountains. Take a stand tonight. I want you to take a stand tonight and look at the walls without intimidation, without fear, without shame, without condemnation, without guilt feelings. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. This is your gospel identity. You can speak to the walls. Tonight, we speak to the walls. We have been an obstruction, a limitation in our life, a hindrance in our life. We speak to hindrances. We speak to limitations. Move away in Jesus' name. Move away in Jesus' name. Leave me alone. Leave us alone. We are kingdom people. We are sons and daughters of the living God. Spirit break out. Heaven come down. Do a good work tonight. Do a good work tonight. Because next week, you will face them. Next week, they will challenge you. Next week, they will mock you. Next week, they will try to in intimidate you. So tonight, take a stand. Take a stand in Christ. Take a stand in the kingdom. Take a stand in God. In the freedom the Son has bought for us. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you tonight, Father. Thank you for young generation taking a stand for you. Taking a stand for freedom. Taking a stand for victory. Taking a stand for progression and advancement. In Jesus' name. Keep going. Just a few more seconds. Maybe half a minute. Just, just take a stand. You don't have to win the war tonight. God will win the war, but you must take a stand. You must show God, I want to overcome this. I will overcome this. God, help me. So help me, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. All right, you may be seated. You might think, is that all? It's very important to take a stand. Very important. 
You might not have won the war tonight, but you took a stand. And God saw that. He saw that there is something inside of, the, inside of you he can build upon. There is a determination. There are words coming out of your mouth which are very clear and very accurate. You want these walls down because you want to be a continuing generation. Can we say many of that? Okay, let me introduce you to more, two more walls. Okay, can I have the presentation? One, two, three, four, five. Must be six. Five? One, two, three, four. Whatever. Number X. Five, yes. Number five. The wall of indecisiveness. I hope it's English. If it's not, it's Philippish. I make words from time to time. I mean, that's the freedom we have in Christ. If we don't find words, we make some. As long as we understand the meaning. <laughs> it's good, huh? In, indecisiveness. All right, thank you, Paul. Leading to feelings of inadequacy. All right, Joshua 18, 1 and 2. Can we go there? Are you awake tonight? Okay, Joshua 18. This morning and tonight, I am in instruct. I give you instructions because I found out that we need instruction. God has in to instruct us, not only to inspire us, but also to instruct us, so we know what to do. Okay, Joshua 18. Did you find it? That was the question. Did you find it? Okay. Please answer questions. Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land lay subdued before them. But then verse 2. There remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. It's like... What on earth are they doing? I mean, Caleb was very clear. He did what he had to do. Others did as well. Joshua did as well. The Z sisters did as well. The sons of Joseph did. But still, there were seven tribes who had not taken their inheritance. Verse 3. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, How long? Will you put off going in to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? Say after me, has given you. Has given you. He has given it. How long? Will you be indecisive? Provide, then he gave them a strategy, provide three men from each tribe and I will send them out and that they may sit out and go up and go up and down the land and so on and comes a practical way of doing it. But here we have a lot of people, seven tribes, that's a lot, out of 12. And they were still doing zip, zero, nothing. Unbelievable. We have people like that in our churches. I mean, we had our church for almost over 20 years now. I don't want to speak bad about them because we have good people, serious people. But we still have people who don't take what is theirs. And from time to time, my wife and I, we are talking together thinking, how long will they wait? Because God has been speaking about that for years. There must come a new generation who is not waiting. But they have that decisiveness in their heart, that determination. I can give you an example. I spoke with one of our spiritual daughters somewhere else in the, on this planet. And she's praying for us these two weeks. And she said to me, what did you speak about? So I explained to her, you know, beyond wars one, external wars, beyond wars two, internal wars. 
Whoa, when are you going to tell us more about that? Immediately. Hunger. Tell us more about that. That's the type of spirit God wants to raise and develop inside of us. Welcome that spirit. Are you here tonight? Yes. Uh, just, just checking up. The wall of indecisiveness, seven tribes. Let me give you the last one. The power of choice. Can you go back to number five? Thank you. The Holy Spirit can give us the power of choice. Making choices. Indecisiveness is a serious war. I remember once I had, uh, I've had weddings from time to time. And... Uh, we had a church camp, and one of the young men who had to marry a girl in our, uh, not a girl, a woman, okay, a woman in our church, he, she, he was at the camp, and she was at the camp, and he said to me in a break, Pastor Phil, can I talk with you? I said, yes, you can talk with me. Of course, you can take, talk with me. So we talked, and they had to marry. They had to be, the wedding was a week after. And he said to me, you know, do you, do you think she's the right one? And I'm thinking, I mean, you know this face? That's speaking in tongues. <laughs> you, you, you can get the interpretation. I'm thinking, what is wrong with you? I say, if you are in that place, do not marry her. Why should she marry such an, I mean, there are words for that, but let's, let's stick to that one indecisive person okay then we s indecisiveness I know that problem because I've been like that for many years when I married my wife I was a teenager I mean I was 21 but I was still a teenager and God had to really hit me hard so I woke up to responsibility and decision-making make choices because I was so afraid of making the wrong decisions and I postponed all the time. And I'm happy I had a very strong elder. Maybe he was a little bit too strong, but in that situation, it helped me a lot. He said to me, either you take a decision or we don't want you as a pastor. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. But he was right. Because there were certain issues in the church. I was the one in charge. I had to take a decision. I had to talk with certain people. I had to confront certain people. I had to tell them certain truths. And I was so afraid of doing that. So, but I'm not anymore because I know it's a help for people. So indecisiveness is not okay. But in the Holy Spirit, there is power to take right, righteous decisions. So next time you read Acts 1.8, that when the Spirit comes upon you, He will give you power. It's more than signs and wonders and miracles. It's also the power of decision, of cho choosing right. Amen? Okay, let's get to the last one. Whew. This one is a little bit hot. The wall of wrong or inflated self-image Oh, take a breath, breathing, leading to deception and blindness. Joshua 19, verse 50. I will wait for the translators. Yeah, make sure you translate this right. <laughs> the wall of wrong or inflated self image. You know, there are certain things we cannot say when we are just 25 years old. But now I'm 69, so there I can say things like that without people being hurt or offended. Because we've seen certain things, and we don't want your walk with him to abort. Okay, we don't want any more casualties. Now, Joshua 19, verse 50. Let's go there. Let's see what happens there. 
By command of the Lord, are you there? Joshua 19. Did you find it? Okay. By command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he asked for. That's Joshua. Timnat, Sirah, in the hill country of Ephraim. And he rebuilt the city and settled in it. This is about Joshua. And this is what I want to tell you. That we leaders, we have to pull down internal walls as well. We never come to a place in our lives, whatever ministry we have, whatever the results of our ministry, if there are thousands of healings and people resurrected from the dead or starting churches and whatever we are doing, God will bless it, God will multiply it, God will bless us, God will produce results. But we are not the exception. We still have to pull down internal walls. Are you with me? So sometimes we leaders can have an inflated self-image. Especially when things go very well. I am mentoring a pastor who has a church of 6,000 people. They are on the way to 10,000. And what impressed me in his life, he's, I think, you age poor, something like that. What impressed me in him is his humility and his willingness to be mentored and to be instructed and trained. I don't know what to do about that, but <laughs> I will find out because God knows how to help him build that church and migrate that church from charismatic, whatever it is, to a kingdom church, to a kingdom base in the nation. I said to the church recently, I also said that in Romania, when my wife and I, we were there at the end of June. There are moments where we have to be careful not to take ourselves too seriously. Smile to me. Okay? I have to tell myself that from time to time. If I don't do that, my wife will tell me. And that's a big help. You know, Philip, just relax, okay? Breathe in, breathe out, and everything is going to be okay. Because sometimes things, I mean, we are called to be blessed. Are you here tonight? We are called to be blessed. We are called to see fruits. We are called to see results. We are called to see miracles. I know a pastor, he has resurrected eight dead people. We are, we are called to see things like that. But in that process, where we see things like that, we must watch ourselves so we don't get a wrong or inflated self-image because it will lead us to deception that I am doing great. Look at the... I mean, if you go to pastor's conference, the first question is always the same. How many members do you have? Question number two. Do you own... Your own building. It's like, how important is that? The question is, how is the food bearing going? Let me, can I give you a footnote about fruits? I think Pastor Emmanuel was there. Let me give you a small, my contribution to that. I believe there are three types of fruits. Number one is the fruit of the Spirit. And that's not plural, that's singular. The fruit of the Spirit. That's one type of fruit. The second type of fruit is the fruit of the kingdom, which means what the kingdom produces in our lives. The third type of fruit is our fruit. What is our fruit? It's people. It's people. It's sons and daughters. We observed Emma, Emma this morning. There was a fruit coming, <laughs> growing inside of her. That's the, that's the fruit. In the kingdom, I have to bear 
fruit. The spirit has to bear fruit. The kingdom has to shape me in the likeness of Christ. The ultimate goal is I have to reproduce myself in sons and daughters. That's my fruit. And we are called to bear fruit. So I said to our people in the church, when they said to me, mm, pastors, we have, I don't know, 75 chairs, chairs and we are filling maybe 65 of them. And they said to me, oh, it will be great the day that people are filling the last chairs. And I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, how do you think these people will come? Because they'll have to come through them. You know, when our children got married, they didn't look at us and say, Dad, can you produce some grandchildren? Okay, did you get that one? I mean, you had biology as I did in school. Okay. They don't look at us and say, Oh, Dad, you know, you and Mom, and you can, you know, go for it. And I mean, we are so nice. So you can. Pr no, no, the grandchildren, that's their business. You go and do it. Are you with me? It's the same in the church. You have to bear fruit. You have to multiply. But before you multiply, God has to validate your life. Can I say this to you? I mean, it's difficult to say yes or no because you don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> but for some years, I, had, I said to God, God, do not multiply our church. Because we have enough already of this type of believers. But please change us into the likeness of Christ. And when you see that and you are pleased with that, then go ahead and multiply our lives. Because we don't need more people like the people we have. Is that too sharp? Is that too black and white? I am like that. If you don't like it, don't invite me. Sometimes we have to say certain things. That's why when Jesus came out of the water, when he was baptized, God, the Father said, heaven opened, the Spirit came upon him, and the Father said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What does that mean? For me, for years, it meant, okay, you know, even Jesus needed encouragement. No, he did not. He was the Son of God. What the father wanted to say, wanted to say and said in that occasion was, I want people like him. Period. If you can be like him, I will be well pleased with you. Now we don't have to produce that because it's something God is going to shape in our lives. We cannot perform it. We cannot achieve it. Are you with me? It's something, it's the work of the spirit. It's the, the fruit of the kingdom. It is, the fruit of the Spirit. But then God can validate our life and say, Whoa, man, I want more people like you. Because you are more and more like my own son. I want more people like you. Are you with me? Uh -huh. So as God is blessing us, as God is multiplying our lives, and we have sons and daughters, and you have sons and daughters, and you, of course, you bring them to the house bring to the house of your fathers, then we have to watch ourselves. Not to be self-inflated and say, we have a great church. I did a great job. But there is humility and partnership with God is powerful. So whatever happens, stay humble. Stay connected. Walk with Him. Even, even if you go to the hospital downtown and you heal a whole department of the hospital, go from bed to bed and heal everybody, stay humble, walk with him. Are you listening to me? Yes. Don't start a new church. You know, Pastor Philip, you know, how many people did you heal the last year? Three, four, five. I just healed, you know, 200. So I think I will, you know, have a moment. No, no. Keep coming to the church. Because healing the sick is normal. 
There's, a, there's something following every single believer. These signs shall follow those who believe me. So let's stay humble. Let's be good partners with God. Whatever happens, even if you resurrect the dead, stay humble. Walk with God. Stick to the house. Stick to your fathers. Amen? Partner with God. And he will continue to use you and bless you. Finally, I have to sh shut up and sit down. And then we'll have a time of worship. Let me give you four simple advices. Are you ready for that? Yeah. I'm all wet. And these four advices I find in chapter 24 of the book of Joshua. I'm very impressed by Joshua, I must say. Because he saw, he saw all that. He walked through the wilderness with Moses. He saw a whole generation be wiped out. He entered the land. He saw Jericho come down. He saw I come down. He overcome the kings, all these kings. They overcame the chariots of Aaron. Joshua is an amazing man. But then he had to fight the internal war, and he did that quite well. At the end of the book of Joshua, when he came close to the end of his life, his physical life, he spoke to the whole nation. Very interesting speech. I told the pastors once when we had ice in Denmark a couple of years ago, this chapter is still calling me and inspiring me because Joshua is such a strong man of God. At the end of his life, he gave four advices. Are you ready? Yes. I will not explain. I will just give it to you. Take note of that. Put in your notes. And hear what I'm saying. Number one. Rise to the call. Rise to the call. I don't say the challenge because we use the word challenge so much we don't maybe appreciate it anymore. Rise to the call. Because basically Joshua said, God has helped us, God has guided us, God has given the victory. But from now on, you have to rise to the call. God has been so good to us, but now you have to rise to the challenge. That's why in verse 15, he cried out the words all Christians know so well. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But that's the only verse we know from that chapter. He said more than that. But he, he made a stand. He rose to the call. Even it was at the end of the chapter, he died. But he took a stand like you did before in this session. Rise to the call. My wife and I, we have spoken to God the last six, eight months. And we have said to God, we will still rise to the call. We are not retiring. We will continue to push. We will continue to train people. We will continue to mentor people. We continue to raise people. We continue to instruct sons and daughters. So we'll keep rising to the call. Number two. You can find it in Joshua 24. Trust me. Okay? Number two. Be sincere. If you play games... Can I say that to you? If you play games, just forget it. Be a sweet, nice Christian. Raise your sweet, nice Christian hands. Raise your nice, sweet Christian voice. And manage your own business. Leave us. Let us do what we have to do. Be sincere. Don't play games. Don't play drama. Don't pretend to be somebody you are not. Just be sincere. Be who you are. And let God shape you, inform you. Let God take the knife of flint, as Paul said this morning. Sometimes he does that. Put us in the corner, brings the knife, and we like. 
Welcome it. Be honest. There is something wrong, there is something wrong. Something has to be corrected, Some, something has been to be corrected. Are you with me? Rise to the core, be sincere. Number three, stay clean. Paul and Emma spoke this morning about purity. In Joshua 24, do you know what God said in Joshua 24? Or do you just know, for me, my house will serve the Lord. God said to them, I have seen that in your homes you are carrying false gods. I've seen that. When I read that, when I found out the first time, I thought, how could they do that after all the years? After leaving Egypt, after walking through the wilderness, after entering, after pulling down Jericho, after overcoming the chariots of Ar they were still carrying false gods in their suitcases or behind the fridge. I don't know where they were, but they were there. And God said, you better get rid of them. Let me say this to you. I believe that sometimes God sees wrong things in our lives. But he does not address them right now. He will say something like, that's a Whitney Houston quote. He will say like, it's not right, but it's okay for now. But there will be one day in the course of time where God will say to you, say to me, in the light of what is to come, this will not be okay anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's not condemning you because you had it. You had the problem. You had the issue. You, 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 you have anger in your heart or you have hot temper and... God has somehow accepted it. But in the course of your walk, and in the light of what is to come, God might tell you, this has been not right, but okay until now. But in the light of the future, it's not okay anymore. So it's a positive correction. You understand what I'm saying? It's not hitting you in the face and say, how could you do that to me? No, it's, a, it's in the light of what is to come. So Joshua said to them, please clean the mess at home. Remove these things. Stay clean. Number four, the last one. Then we'll have a time of worship and present ourselves to God. Are you ready for the last one? Number one was rise to the call. I challenge you to rise to the call. Number two, be sincere. Oh, Christians, they're experts in playing games. Oh, hallelujah, Pastor Philip, you know, great. And, and you feel nauseous when they say that. And you know it's not right. So how are you doing? Oh, fantastic. God is good. Okay, God is good. What about you? Oh, I'm well too, Pastor. Thank you for asking. I'm well too. And what about you, Pastor? I'm, I'm good too, you know. Be sincere, okay? Number three, stay clean. If God addresses some issues in the light of what is to come, that's why I call my theme positioning a young generation for the next decade. Because certain things have been in your life, have been in my life until now. But in the next decade, what has been okay is not okay anymore. Okay? Number four, the last one. Choose accountability. At the end of Joshua 24, Joshua said to them, I have heard you, God has heard you, and there is a stone here which has heard you as well. Now, we don't have a stone here tonight, but it means be accountable. Choose accountability. 
Okay? Walk with your spiritual fathers and tell them, I want to be accountable. I want to be honest with you. I want to rise to the call. I don't know how to do that. I don't know what, even what the call is about, but I will rise to the call. I decide to be a sincere person. I want to tell you that I will stay clean. Okay? So I choose to be accountable to you. All right? These four advices, there is one more, but I will, I will not go into that. It will take me too, too far. These four advices are there in Joshua 24. You can come home with the team. Yes. And I want to give them to you tonight. I'm leaving tomorrow morning, so that's the conclusion of our message about overcoming the internal walls. As they prepare the songs and you get ready to have an encounter with God and speak to Him and face Him, His wonderful face, there is no anger, no reproach, no condemnation for whoever is in Christ. In His eyes, there is only a desire to see me grow, to see you grow and do well. And multiply you so your life can become 5, 10, 15. Who knows? You might lead people in the hundreds in the kingdom. Who knows? The last comment I will say before we have an encounter, meet him, talk with him, is this. If you just turn the page, Joshua 24. You go into the book of Judges. Okay? If you read the book of Judges, you will see phenomenal people. Gideon, Samson, Deborah, wonderful men and women. But you know what? At the end of the book of Judges, they are exactly the same as at the beginning. Nothing had happened. It was a shock for me. I discovered that, I think, one and a half year ago. Because for me, judges, whoa, Samson, whoa. I mean, don't look at me, I'm not like that. Uh, these people, whoa, they, they were my heroes. But suddenly I understood that the book of Judges is extremely supernatural. At the same time, it's extremely sad. Because even God gave them heroes. The people did not progress at all. The first sign of progress took place when Samuel came into the picture. This little boy wrote by his mother, this is my boy. Eli, this is my boy. I want to give him to the Lord. That was a turning point. Not Samson, not Gideon. Samuel. I love these stories. I love these stories. Amazing stories. Are you hearing something tonight? Let's stand. I don't know where God will lead us tonight. I trust also my brothers, Mr. Heine, Mr. Kwan, Mr. Paul as well. But tonight, I want you to meet him, face him. You have already taken a stand concerning your eternal world, so you don't have to do that again, okay? But maybe you should... Maybe you should take a stand when it comes to... to rise to the call. Don't hide in church. I spoke with some of our, one of our sons yesterday night. He said, I have looked at others all the time. What are they doing? I said to him, don't look at others. Look at yourself. You grow up. If he goes, I go. Shut up and walk. Rise to the call. Don't hide in church. Oh, I love Paul, you know, when he leads the worship. Also, you worship. You open your mouth and worship him. Are you with me? Rise to the call. Number two, be sincere. Number three, stay clean. Number four, choose accountability. 
Can we take that tonight? Can we take that tonight? That was the question. Can we take that tonight? And face him and say, God, this is my decision tonight. I will rise to the call. Even I feel intimidated or inadequate or my life is not in order yet, I will still rise to the call. So just lead me, instruct me, shape me. Do whatever you want. Take the knife, whatever. Just help me, Father. I promise God I will, I will develop since a new sincerity in my life. And God, if I have false gods, idols, here and there, behind the fridge, or on the computer, or in my head, help me to stay clean. Choose accountability. So let's praise him, let's worship him, let's meet him tonight. Okay? Can we do that? Okay. So let's do that.